Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the King Novi or Peepo Mini Pocket, a seven inch laptop running Windows 11 that's available from AliExpress from around $200 or pounds. Bargain. As a fan of ultra portables, I couldn't resist. So I bought one to see if it could be a viable option for photographers who like me want to travel as light as possible. Now I currently use a 14 inch MacBook Pro for most of my work and even a couple of years later, it's more than fast enough to handle everything I throw at it. But at about 1.6 kilograms or three and a half pounds, it's not something that I really want to carry around with me very often, especially for long trips or basic tasks. Oh, and before anyone suggests that I just go to the gym, I do swim most days. It's just that after a lifetime of long hikes, inept snowboarding, and lugging a lot of heavy gear around, my knees just aren't what they used to be. So nowadays, I have to be careful about how much weight, especially that I carry in my backpack. I realize that phones and tablets are the lightweight solution for most people, but by the time I brought along a Bluetooth keyboard for entering a decent amount of text and a stand to hold the phone or tablet up, they're not so portable anymore. But a bigger issue for me personally is that I always feel I'm struggling to work around a mobile operating system when it comes to getting images out of my camera and viewed or backed up. Now some apps can work well, but others less so, or even not at all. Believe me, I've attempted this mobile route many times and it's just never been anywhere near as consistent or reliable as just using a proper laptop. So what I'm looking for is the smallest possible laptop that runs a full desktop operating system, has a half decent keyboard, plenty of storage for photo backup and a bigger screen than my phone. Now, back in the 90s, when I wrote for Personal Computer World magazine in the UK, there were actually loads of ultra portables around. And I reviewed most of them, most notably the Toshiba Libretto series at the high end, not to mention a bunch of palm tops running simple software, but with respectable keyboards, including my beloved Scion Series 5. By the way, if you are a Scion fan, you might enjoy my retrospective review of the Series 5 on my Dynabytes Vintage channel. But as phones and tablets gradually took over ultra portable duties for most people, the market for tiny laptops, palm tops, and netbooks mostly disappeared to a point where today, the lightest MacBook Air, considered one of the most portable mainstream laptops, still weighs over 1.2 kilograms. Sure, it's a lovely laptop and light for what it offers, but it's roughly double the size and weight of what I'm personally looking for. While the traditional laptop brands seem to have lost the appetite for true ultra portables, a variety of Chinese companies have recognized an opportunity. GPD is one of the leaders here, producing a series of desirable portables, albeit mostly aimed at PC gamers and some costing over a grand. I was kind of half tempted until a friend on Twitter, remember them, mentioned a model that they'd seen on Amazon selling for around 300 pounds. I did a bit of digging and after spotting several similar models from different companies, thought I'd check AliExpress to see if they were in fact rebranded. And here's what I found. I think this is the original unbranded model made in China by King Novi or Peepo, and often starting at just under $200 or pounds, depending on coupons and discounts. Now, if you've ordered this kind of thing in the past, you'll know that the images and specs that are used in the advertising aren't always an accurate depiction of what'll actually turn up at your door. But in this case, two weeks after ordering, my mini laptop arrived in the UK and appeared to match the description. So here's what I bought for a total of 241 pounds, including shipping, a mini clamshell laptop with an Intel Celeron J4105 quad core processor running at 1.5 gigahertz, 12 gigs of RAM and a one terabyte SSD drive with Windows 11 pre-installed and activated. The only options at the time of ordering are selecting a drive size from 128 gig to two terabytes and which type of AC plug you'd prefer. The claimed battery life is two to three hours, which so far in use seems realistic. Upgrading my drive to one terabyte only cost around 30 pound more than the base 128 gig model, so it seemed like a good deal. Although it is easy enough to access the drive socket behind a flap underneath if you'd like to buy and fit your own. As for the operating system, the Windows 11 installation looks legit at first glance, but unsurprisingly, no disks or activation codes were provided. I've heard of people installing their own versions of Windows or Linux on it, although I've not personally tried that yet. One YouTuber though, S-Tech, has made a series of useful videos about this particular laptop, as well as generously opening a forum dedicated to it. So if you'd like more tips, drivers, or operating system advice, I'd recommend checking it out. The laptop certainly fits the bill on size and weight with a 186 by 140 mm footprint, 
21 mil thickness and a weight of just 680 grams or one and a half pounds, roughly half that of a MacBook Air. Considering the price, it's also remarkably well built with an aluminium alloy shell, robust screen hinge and no sharp edges, rough joins or telltale creaks. Opening the lid reveals a compact but surprisingly usable keyboard. Sure, it's not backlit, the keys are small and some light tab may take a moment to find and remember, but there's reasonable travel and they're a hell of a lot easier and a lot more pleasant to type on than a phone or tablet screen. Meanwhile, the little red circle between the split space bar is what IBM laptop owners previously called a nipple, and it's used to push the pointer around the screen. The two buttons below the split space bar are the left and right mouse clicks if you need them. While I've happily tweaked many a um, joystick in the distant past, I couldn't personally get on with this one though as the speed and response vary too much for my liking. Your mileage may vary. You can of course connect a wired or wireless mouse, or like me, mostly end up using the touch screen, which proved surprisingly effective for navigating a desktop operating system on a small display, even with your fingers or thumbs. Speaking of which, the laptop features a 7-inch actual screen with a 16x10 shape and 1280x800 resolution, so 16x9 videos will play back with very thin bars above and below, but still deliver a comfortably larger image than most phones. Now I expected the worst from the image quality on the screen, but again was pleasantly surprised. It's bright, crisp, colourful, has minimal bleed and again effective touch capabilities that I ended up using for most of my day-to-day -day navigation. Sure, the bezels are quite wide, but they can act as thumb rests when you're gripping the laptop in both palms. In fact, this works pretty well and I found I could just about reach most parts of the screen with my thumbs in this position without putting it down. There's also a basic camera built into the left bezel that's fine at a push, but if you have your phone with you, you'll almost certainly enjoy better quality from that instead. Audio is no highlight either. The built-in speakers are unsurprisingly tinny with a complete absence of any bass, and due to the size of the device, the cooling fan runs pretty much all of the time. Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my first looks review of the Fujifilm GFX100 Mark II. Thankfully though, it is fairly quiet, and becomes barely audible if there's any ambient noise. I also tried both wired earphones and Bluetooth headphones, and both will give you a big upgrade in sound quality. On the right-hand side, you'll find a 3.5mm headphone jack, a Type-A USB port, and what the manufacturer calls a TF card slot, more about which in a moment, while around the back are another Type-A USB port, the power socket, and a mini HDMI port for connecting to external displays. So the first thing to know is there is no USB-C nor any kind of USB charging at all. Instead, you charge the laptop using a supplied AC adapter with an old style barrel plug. I might as well get this out of the way right now. This for me is the major downside of this particular laptop in the modern world. I don't wanna go back to the days when I took a separate charger for almost every device. And this one's even larger if you have to factor in an adapter for your local AC socket. One solution is to use a USB-C to barrel adapter, which could negotiate the correct voltage from a compatible power delivery source. You're looking for one with a 12 volt DC output and a barrel that's three and a half mil in diameter with a 1.3 mil positive pin in the center. I bought one, but found it would only output nine volts with all of my USB charges today from power banks to my heftiest MacBook charger. I believe you'll need a very specific USB power delivery source that is capable of outputting 12 volts when requested with two and a half amps for this to work properly. So for me, it's a work in progress right now, although I am reassured that YouTuber Estec has had more success on this front. And bonus points to Estec for also saving me from opening up this unit. In one of their videos, they actually discovered a USB-C port on the motherboard next to the HDMI, but without a hole to access it in the case. Turns out this can work for data, like connecting external drives, but not for charging. So perhaps it was hidden to prevent accidental damage. Who knows? But if you have a Dremel, lock yourself out. Okay, so what about the pair of official USB ports? The specs say one is USB 2, while the other is 3.1, but doesn't go as far as to actually label them or tell you which is which. Now I'm sure you can guess which is the faster one, but I did a drive speed test with both using external USB SSD drive. First, here's the score for the internal SSD drive using Crystal Diskmark 8, where it scored 542 and 501 megabytes per second for reads and writes in the first sequential test. Now for the external SSD drive connected to the USB port on the side, 
where it scored around 40 megabytes per second for read and write in the first of the sequential tests. Whoa, that's terrible. And finally, for the same external SSD drive plugged into the back, where it scored just over 460 megabytes for read and write, again in the same test. So clearly the rear USB port is the one to use for drives and data transfer, leaving the slower side port for basic peripherals like wired mice or keyboards. Moving on to the card slot, King Novi refers to it as TF, short for Trans Flash, a lesser known format that essentially evolved into microSD. The bottom line is the slot seems to work fine with the micro SD cards that I tried, including those straight from my GoPro Hero 10. And here's some footage that I copied to it from a recent trip, playing back just fine. Sure, I wish it had a full size SD slot, but how many laptops do anymore? And space really is at a premium here. So for reading SD cards, I just use a basic old USB adapter in the rear port, of course, for the best speeds. Here I'm copying a load of photos from my trusty Fujifilm X100V for viewing, basic editing and backup. This is a simple task I do all the time with my main laptop, but one which proves hard to impossible to do on my phone. For starters, there's about 30 gigabytes worth of data being copied here in one go across over 1500 files. I don't have that kind of spare space on my phone, and even if I did, I often find that mobiles and camera apps aren't always 100% stable for copying this number of files in one go. Secondly, if you're using a dedicated app to connect to your camera, you won't always get the chance to access your raw files or, or even full-size JPEGs or videos. But here I just selected everything in the folder, clicked copy, then pasted it to a destination folder without fuss. It's so easy. And now that it's on my laptop, I can exploit any number of backup options, which again aren't limited in some obscure way by their mobile versions. This functionality and access to a large amount of storage is what I really wanted on the move and was missing on my own mobiles. Okay, now for some more tests, starting with Geekbench 6 for a basic overall benchmark. The mini laptop under mains power scored 261 for single core and 560 for multi-core. So let me know in the comments how that compares to your ultra portables. Moving on to wireless, some mini or budget laptops have limited Wi-Fi capabilities, but I'm pleased to report this one will connect to both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz AC networks. Here's the score measured by speedtest.net on my home Wi-Fi system using my 14 inch MacBook Pro on the left and the King Novi on the right tested moments apart from the same desk and I was sure to use the same server too. Both machines were also connected to my 5 GHz Wi-Fi network with my access point outside the room and one floor up. Clearly the MacBook is faster here, especially for download speed at the same distance, but if you can move the mini laptop closer to the access point, its speeds will improve considerably. So clearly its antenna isn't as capable as the one in the larger MacBook. This could be an issue if you're in a location that has a weak signal, like say some hotel rooms, so do be warned. If you are reasonably close to an access point though, the browsing experience with the King Novi was perfectly adequate for most sites, and I found that the touch screen worked pretty well for scrolling or tapping. In fact, I was struck by how close the experience felt to using a mini tablet, despite the screen not folding completely open like a convertible or hybrid device. It's also fine for watching YouTube or other streaming services, even if you switch the quality to the highest settings. Do remember though that the screen resolution isn't even full HD 1080p, so there's no point in selecting anything higher than 720p if you get the choice to do so. Okay, so how about some photo applications? I feel that I'm in the minority, but I've always preferred using Adobe Bridge and Photoshop as a combination rather than Lightroom. So here's Bridge browsing that folder of images that I copied over earlier from the X100V. So these are 26 megapixel images with a handful of panoramas. And for this first demo, I'm gonna concentrate on JPEGs. If you're familiar with these applications, you'll notice the screen real estate looks a bit cramped and with only 1280 by 800 pixels to play with, you'll need to be pretty careful with your use of palettes. I've also auto minimized the taskbar at the bottom to free up a bit more space. Browsing my images here isn't exactly the fastest process and sending one over to Photoshop does take a few seconds, but these are the latest 2024 versions of Creative Cloud running on a pretty modest system. As for control, I found I could tap through to most menus with my fingers and thumbs alone. But for more precise adjustments like tweaking sliders, you will want to either connect a separate mouse as I have here, or buy yourself some kind of stylus to use with the touchscreen. Okay, how about upping the ante further still? Let's try and process a raw file using the same workflow, starting in Adobe Bridge, before launching into Camera Raw. 
Just in case you're interested, this was a 10 second exposure of the Milky Way that I took with the X100V at 6400 ISO, with the lens stopped down to f2.8 for sharper star images in the corners. Again, while it's clearly not the fastest laptop around, it is sufficiently responsive for some basic adjustments on this 26 megapixel raw image. I'm using a full size wide mouse again here on my desk for more accurate control, but for travel, I'd go for a smaller wireless model. Unsurprisingly, it takes a few seconds to send the file over to Photoshop, but remember this is in 16 bits and once loaded, I can continue to make adjustments with reasonable response. Now, I wouldn't recommend this laptop alone for any heavy lifting, but the fact is if I did need to use the full versions of Bridge, Camera Raw or Photoshop for whatever reason, it's all possible with a little patience. Now, I'm not much of a mobile gamer, but I know that some of you would want to see how it performs. So here's a quick demo of Minecraft using the default settings. Obviously for smoother performance in some games, you will want to tweak the graphics options. And now it's time for my final verdict. The King Novi or Peepo 7 inch mini laptop turned out to be a surprisingly capable device given the size and price. The case, screen and keyboard are all way better quality than you'd expect. The internals are just about fast enough to run full Windows 11 without driving you nuts. And the chance to accommodate up to two terabytes of internal storage means that it's a viable option for backing up lots of photos and videos on the move. And you're getting all of this in a significantly smaller, lighter, and probably cheaper package than most laptops. Of course, any laptop costing from $200 or pounds isn't gonna be perfect. For me personally, the major issues on this model are a lack of USB charging, an ineffective point control, modest screen resolution, and tinny speakers. Plus the small battery won't last much more than a long movie, and you'll need to be quite close to your Wi-Fi for the best speeds. But for me personally, none of these are deal breakers for my target use, especially since my primary concern of USB-C charging could be possible with a suitable adapter. Don't get me wrong, I wouldn't recommend it as your primary computer or laptop unless your usage is very modest. And if you're happy with the apps and storage on your phone or tablet and just want a more pleasant typing experience, then of course go and get yourself a nice Bluetooth keyboard instead. That makes much more sense. But if you're looking for one of the smallest and lightest devices that can run full windows with plenty of storage for backing up photos and a way better keyboard than your phone or tablet for banging out messages, then it's a surprisingly compelling option. So let me know what you think in the comments. Would this be a viable option for you? Have you found a better ultra portable you can recommend to photographers who want or need to travel light? I'd love to hear your lightweight solutions for working on the move. And if you'd like me to review more of these kind of things, do let me know. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.